Would you like to support Cubs Out Loud? One way is to join us over on Patreon. For as little as a buck a month, patrons get early access to our shows, the pre and post show, and various other rewards. You can learn more at patreon.com slash Cubs Out Loud. Thanks to all of our patrons for their support in making this podcast. April 17th, 2022. I'm Jeff. Who's your bear? That's right. I am your bear. And that makes me Gary. Don't hurt nobody with your bad self. And welcome to Comes Out Loud, the Bear Podcast with Sherman Length, episode number uh, 644. And, uh, well, somebody's computer is not working. Uh, we do have with us a guest, Edward Angelini Cook, who we love to have here all the time. Yay! Yay! Oh, wait a minute. I'm 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 sorry. I I apologize. Uh, I need to say this properly. We have Doctor Edward Angelini Cook. Please. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Uh, so, yeah, somebody successfully defended his dissertation. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Uh, for those of you who have been uh, listening for some time, you may know that uh, Mr. Cook uh, has been on a journey in his educational academia career um, and has been going through several different phases and has fully question mark completed the most recent portion um it's all done correct ed like legit certificate the whole the whole shebang um yeah for the most part uh i just have to do a <laughs> little bit of uh well i think i just did all of the work i just need to upload it to the thing to for it to be copyrighted copy copy writ copy I don't know. I think I actually think it's copy copyrighted. Yeah, righted. Yeah. Righted. Uh and then yeah. And then I will have fulfilled all of my requirements for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in human sexuality studies. Yay. Yay. I went through the applause sound again. <laughs> Ugh. Look but at the, us, the... Jeff. We have two doctors now Ooh. in the course of Cubs Out Loud. Mm-hmm. Dr. Cisco and now oh. Dr. Ed. Yay! He, he's mm. no longer Mr. Ed. No more Mr. Ed. Oh, we're what a ride. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I don't know how many dissertation defenses involved a uh, a fan um, that went <laughs> that said Queen on it, um, and also they were talking about well, you know, now you can call yourself Doctor PBS, Doctor Painful Butt Sex. Um, so that was that was really funny. Who said that? Um, my committee. What an interesting committee you have. <laughs> See, I, I'm sorry. I would have to, to, to amend that statement. You could say PBS, but it's not painful butt sex. It's pleasurable butt sex. Thank you. Oh, no. Mine's specifically on painful butt sex. Oh, <laughs> mm-hmm. both, both exist on the continuum, so to speak. They, they sure do. Yeah. Very nice. So, yes, uh, now our Landscape of Relationships series is doctor certified. Ding! (laughs) Yes! (laughs) So, um, that being said, uh, welcome back for another part of the series. And this one we were actually going to do earlier, but we postponed um, 
So we're going to talk about intimacy and arousal. Mm. Not arousal. Mm. Arousal. <laughs> I can't do that. You cannot roll your out. Sorry, I can't. I, I cannot. Uh, um. <laughs> <laughs> Arousal. Oh, I See, did. you could Around do it. Box. Arousal. You just have to practice it, like you're, like you're playing with your like little beard there in a very like villain esque way. You just need to work your, your rolling your R's in with it. You'll have a whole character to find. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so that yeah. being said, uh, what do we uh, have for our pleasure today? Get it. For our pla- ha, ha, ha. that's funny. Um, so what do we have today? So, um, all right. So I talk about int- intimacy a lot with uh, my clients, and as far as arousal goes, um, I mean, I talk about that too. Uh, but um, we're going to be talking about uh, the different kinds of intimacy. Um, ways that we can um, increase our intimacy with, say, our sexual partner. Um, We are going to talk about uh, what arousal is, problems of arousal, and also how to um, kind of increase our arousal with, say, a partner. Um, And um, so... As far as intimacy goes, like what what do you both think intimacy is? Like what are you like what are what are kind of your ideas of, of intimacy? I mean, intimacy is one of those many things in this entire world to me that has like a spectrum. Uh, where mm-hmm. there's uh, a platonic intimacy where it's just like giving a friend of hot being close. Uh, physically, uh, being able to share those those uh, uh, things you don't normally share share with other people. Having that that close relationship can be having in those close conversations as well. As being physically close, uh, you can have a plutonic version of that. Meanwhile, you get up to more of a romantic one where there's kissing and cuddling and 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 maybe in, in into the whole sexual intimacy. So I would say there's there's different levels. All of them are still intimate in its own own ways. Um, but then there's just like a line where some things change. Sometimes it's a uh, uh, sexual platonic. It could be romantic, sexual, etc. So maybe maybe it's more of a Venn diagram. I don't know. Nice. What about you, Gary? Um, when I think of intimacy, I think about um, if 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 I see myself as like something at the center of several layers, intimacy is about like moving beyond a barrier or a boundary, because I don't. I'm not intimate, quote unquote, with my family. Um, I'm not intimate with my coworkers. I mean, I could be, but I choose not to. So intimacy to me is about sharing something that's very personal um, at a level that I, or a comfort that I feel like you have gained access to, I guess. Absolutely. I love both of those answers. And um, I don't know if we talked about this, like I know that we had the entire um, episode on your, um, creating your party. Uh, you know, I think that that intimacy is also about that. Um, like who you keep in your party, but another way to look at it is, uh, kind of going off of what Gary said about boundaries. Um, I've been kind of framing this like part of me, like a dance club. Um, you know, like we set our cover charge and, um, you know, if you're willing to pay for that cover charge and you can come in, but there are different levels to that, uh, that club. So you have the bottom level. Usually those are people who are like acquaintances, you know, more than strangers. Right. And then as you get up closer to the top level, right. to the VIP room, right. Those are increased levels of intimacy. 
Um, you get to know a little bit more about the club. You have more influence over um, over what the club looks like, you know, things like that. Um, and uh, one of my favorite quotes on intimacy is by a, a late um, relationship therapist by the name of David Snarch. And uh, he said that intimacy is knowing who you are and letting someone else in on the secret. So uh, like what Gary said about, um, you know, this like boundary of understanding, uh, you know, uh, you know, I don't let everybody in on my secret. Um, there are, you know, there is a line that I draw for that. Um, and like what, uh, what Jeff was talking about, there are different kinds of intimacy. Um, so like we have, you know, what I think we think of often when we think of intimacy is sexual intimacy, but there's also emotional intimacy, um, which is really important in any relationship, um, intellectual intimacy, because, you know, it's, um, it can be really vulnerable to have intellectual conversations with another person. I have to know that I'm comfortable um, and safe to share my my thoughts with you. Um, there's aesthetic in intimacy, which is which is very important to me. Um, you know, I love looking at a sunset. Um, I love looking at beautiful things. I love concerts, and I love you know, things like that. And I love sharing that with somebody. Um, so having that intimacy with another person, knowing that like we experience that is really cool. Um, creative intimacy um, is uh, another different kind, uh, recreational intimacy. Um, like there, I don't know if, if you would agree, but there are certain people that I only do certain things with. Um, like, you know, part of our relationship is we uh, go bowling together, right? Um, we, I don't know, um, go to see shows together. We go to concerts together, right? But like our relationship doesn't really extend outside of that. Um, work intimacy, like what Gary was talking about, um, there's crisis intimacy, right? Like who shows up for you uh, during a crisis and how do they show up? Um, that's, that's a really vulnerable uh, experience. Then there's commitment uh, intimacy, which, you know, we're going to talk about um, conflict intimacy, uh, knowing, you know, that I can have healthy conflict with you um, and that it's okay. Um, I think that a lot of people run away from conflict, um, communication, intimacy, like we've talked about in the past, very, 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 very important. Um, and then spiritual intimacy, uh, is also another form of intimacy that, uh, people can share. I think it's interesting to look over this list Ed, that you were just reviewing because I, I would have, if you had asked me to talk about the different kinds of intimacy, I might have given enough time. I might have come up with half. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a big maybe. Um, which which one? Which ones wouldn't you have um, thought of? Communication, recreational, aesthetic. Uh. I'm, I'm I'm not pleased with myself to think to feel that I probably wouldn't have come up with crisis, but when you said it and described it, I was like absolutely, but I don't know if I would have named it or labeled it. Uh, you know, I, I think another thing on here, as somebody who just went through like a really huge thing, right? Um, celebratory intimacy, like mm -hmm. I, um, it was very very important that Jim um, was in some way part of this experience um, and that I had somebody that I trusted and that I loved who was going to be accessible right afterwards. Um, 
and that like everything was very uh, like cultivated like i had pictures like <laughs> lined on my desk um so i think you know with crisis i think it's also yeah celebratory intimacy mm -hmm. I'm i think the that... opposite of crisis i would almost think um yeah i mean i, I mean i you could potentially go into something with an expectation of celebration. But I think those are pretty rare. More often than not, I think the celebration comes after the, uh, I guess, the revelation, the announcement, the honorification. Like, I don't know how to phrase that. Like, because I think about it, um, like, I think if you um, have a surgery and it's really important and the outcome is an unknown. There is an expectation that it is successful and your health will improve, but you won't know that till you get to the other side. Mm -hmm. So I think if you get to the other side and they're like, you are now cancer free, just as an example, then I could see that being celebratory, but you won't know that till you get there. Um, just like um, if an individual is attempting to get pregnant, and has been going through certain steps or procedures, a program, something of that sort. And they're not sure if that has, you know, happened. And then they get the notification or the information that they, you know, are currently pregnant, then that would be celebratory. So I find that interesting. I do agree that I think there, there can be a certain type of intimacy with that because Especially if you spend quite a bit of time and energy putting in an effort to something, to achieving something, um, or obtaining it, or uh, reaching a goal, I guess, that would be important. Um, so yeah, like I think of people who are going on personal journeys physically, maybe it's weight loss, um, maybe it's like, you know, doing a... Um, like a marathon, uh, what are those things called? Mutters, um, you know, triathlons, like, you know, all these different types of things where there's like an endurance factor to it. Um, so, you know, they may have someone, a loved one, a dear friend or something that, you know, is there either to assist or be there at the finish line, so to speak. Um, and then that would be, but, you know, it's, I, they wouldn't, I mean, some people might invite like anybody, but I can see other people who have really worked to a certain degree of like stress and level um, for this achievement may want very specific people to be there to yeah, you know, celebrate with them. And that can be pretty intimate. You know, it's it's something that has a, you know, it's achieving a milestone, I guess. Yeah. Um, like I know for me, uh it, like uh, it's important for me after something happens that there is a kind of level of like, I want you to know first before other people. Um, mm -hmm. Like sometimes I, like if I find out something on Facebook, <laughs> um, I, I feel kind of weird about that. Um, so like with this, I wanted, I had, you know, planned responses to go out to like family members and things like that um, so that they would know before the rest of the world did, right? Um, because obviously people are going to post this on social media, but like I went absolutely dumb <laughs> that day um, and like I kind of equated to like a, a trauma response. Um, like I don't really remember a lot about what happened that day. Um, so, you know, I had to tell my family after the fact, <laughs> right? Like, and I was like, hey, I'm really sorry. And they were like, dude, I don't care. Um, I was like, but it was really important to me that you kind of knew right away. Um, because those are intimate relationships. Right. And I think what you're describing, the, the first thing that came to mind, Ed, as a parallel is like when people uh, celebrate their relationship through a ceremony, um, usually most people consider it marriage, could be hand fasting, you know, could be something else. Um, but some people will have really good recollection of it. 
others I find more often than not in my experience don't remember many details. They know that it happened. They know they were there. They know there's proof. They have generalized feelings, but they don't remember specifics. Um, and it kind of becomes an unintentional blur. Um, and I mean, I think about that, like, I don't remember specifics of my high school graduation or my college graduation. Um, yet I know that they happened. And so that's, you know. so we're actually talking about arousal, right? And that is a form of hyper arousal, um, or hypo arousal, meaning that like, so we have like a baseline of like, I can be present for this, right? But when I get too hyper aroused, that's when my body goes into fight or flight. And when I get too like, like under aroused, that's when my body, body goes into hypo arousal, which is when I like freeze or um, do like other kind of uh, trauma responses. Um, and that's kind of what I think uh, you're, it's like too much to take in. Um, it's, it's too much to stay present. It's right. Like, well, I, I go ahead, Jeff. It's like, uh, uh, my, my, to, to kind of put it an example of where I, I've had it is like, after I've done a show, after mm -hmm. I, when I was in high school and college plays, we finish it. I don't remember what exactly happened during the show. <laughs> All exactly. I know is everything was great, and I just get like an endorphin high or whatever it is for for chemically speaking. That's gives you all and, that and I, and energy, right? And I, and I think that's an example of what I I guess I've always referred to it as like overstimulation, meaning there's too much to process to like comprehend to understand of what's happening, um, and so like it's difficult to to recall specifics out of that which is what i always find interesting cuz when when i when people approach you and talk about a specific moment and you don't recall it it's not that it didn't happen or that you block are blocking it necessarily it just may be that like there just wasn't the capacity to to like make that a prevalent or like a higher priority item for memory recall, let's say, um, mm -hmm. when it comes to that. So yeah, I, I think that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I don't remember how we got there. Well, we were talking about the types of uh, intimacy and we're discussing celebration as a... Oh, right, 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 right. <laughs> um, but I think like, you know, with... Um, with all of these, right? Like it's more than just sexual intimacy, which I think is the thing that we think of the most when we think of intimacy. Um, and that with a relationship, it's more than just sexual intimacy. Um, you know, you can have intimate relationships with your friends and your family that does not involve sex. <laughs> um, well, so here's my question for you. If you, um, like, I don't know if there's another category of intimacy looking over this list that we didn't discuss. If you're a person who does not necessarily um, show your love physically for another person, like, that's not one of your, what do we call those things? We had a show on it. Your love languages? Yes. Yeah. If it's, if it's not your language, so to speak, but you actually do that for another person, like, you touch their arm, touch their shoulder – um, rub their back, hold their hand, but that's not your general communication style. Like, mm -hmm. do you think that qualifies as intimacy in some capacity, but it's not sexual? So I guess like physical intimacy. Well, that's what I'm asking you. Like, like I'm, I'm thinking about that as, as a way, as a, a different form of intimacy, but people may not think of it because it's not, sexual and it's not like foreplay it's not intended to necessarily become um you know brown chicken brown cow i mean it might but that's a whole other thing that needs to be negotiated <laughs> that may not yeah, I mean, they may, may not be the initial intention i guess yeah because i mean like we like we're talking about with the different levels right like i don't go run up and hug strangers on the street i mean Sometimes I might, depending on the 
locale. Uh, but... He just got out of a really good Broadway show. Anyways. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, you know, depending on yeah, the intimacy level, right? Like, I may give you a hug. I may, you know, want to cuddle. I may want to, you know, do these things that aren't necessarily sexual in nature. Um, they're just physical and shows that I have a closer relationship to you, a more intimate relationship. Mm-hmm. Then Joe Blow over there. Gary, you okay. have a face. Because you said Joe Blow, but anyways. Oh my god, are you twelve? <laughs> have you seen this show? I I multiples of twelve. <laughs> okay, fine. I was I was giggling too internally. <laughs> I mean, because blowing could be a Think of intimacy. That could definitely be some sexual intimacy. <laughs> um, you know how to whistle, don't you? <laughs> and blow. Um, all right. So we're talking about these different kinds of intimacy. Um, oh, and, you know, also when we talk about intimacy, I think it's important to remember that. Um, the intimacy that you have in your relationship with, say, your partner, um, does like you don't have to share all kinds of intimacy. Like you know, I like I said, I love aesthetic intimacy. My husband could care less. <laughs> um, he doesn't care. Um, his more thing is about um, entertainment. Um, and kind of recreational, like watching TV, spending time together is more of his intimacy and the thing that's more important to him. Um, and intellectual, I, of course. I was just going to say, I think that's interesting, Ed, because like as I've been learning more about various things through the, through the history of being a part of this podcast, um, one of the things over like the past year I've been – uh, determining for myself is potentially that I'm demisexual, that I need to like be stimulated by you, your intellect, your personality. Like I need to kind of have a bond with you before I'm necessarily that interested in you. Um, mm-hmm. And that's a whole different realm of things. So when you were kind of talking about that, I was like, like that is another factor of like the intimacy with a person is that there may be some things that come first before others. Yeah, um, I think we've and I think we've talked about the fact that uh, you know I know something that I have struggled with in the past is the fact that uh, you know my husband isn't as excitable <laughs> as I am about well, everything. Uh, so. You know, like when I see, you know, like I said, when I see a sunset, I like, you know, get a hard on. Um, and he's like, whoa. And, you know, like I love to go sightseeing and I love to explore. And he's like, no. Um, but that doesn't mean that is a problem. Uh, and that, you know, I love to experience those with people. And I can, right? Like I can... I can explore and I can go sightseeing with other people and have that connection. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's not a problem that it's not necessarily my husband that I'm doing it with. Right. That makes sense to me. Yeah. That's something that has been difficult for me to learn because, you know, like there is a grieving process that goes along with the fact that like, Oh, this person that I'm married to, doesn't get excited at a sunset, (laughs) Um, you know, and, but that's okay. Um, He doesn't have to in order for me to enjoy it. Um, So levels of intimacy, levels of intimacy, right? So we're talking about this, like, kind of like dance club. Um, So at like, so there's, Based on this, uh, you know, research that I I found, um, there's like five levels of intimacy. 
So on the bottom level, we have safe communication, right? Like, you know, you've paid your cover, you can come in and, um, you know, we have safe communication, uh, meaning that like it is respectful, it's consensual, right? It's um, all of the qualities of healthy communication. Um, Then we come up to like, maybe another level to others opinions and beliefs. So here's where we are communicating about um, what we have heard other people talk about and what other people believe. Um, Then we move up a level and we talk about uh, our own personal opinions and our beliefs, right? And that requires, you know, I think with each of these levels requires vulnerability, um, even more safety and more intimacy. Like I have to know who I am. I have to know my own personal opinions and my own personal beliefs in order to communicate them to you. Um, then we go, then we move up to level two, my feelings and my experiences, which are sacred to me, right? Like my feelings are really important to me, right? So like sharing my feelings and my experiences with another person, um, that's a whole other level of vulnerability. Um, and it's really important that we recognize these levels and that, you know, if we are sharing my feelings and my experiences on level one, maybe you're opening your door to get hurt. If you don't have that safety and that vulnerability um, there, you could get hurt. Um, Then we move up to the highest level of this, uh, intimacy pyramid, if you will. Um, And we are communicating our needs, our emotions and our desires um, with a with another person. Um, And I I like this, right? Uh, Because it kind of shows that there are levels of closeness with another person and and levels of where I know that I feel safe to communicate these areas. I think it's interesting that there's sort of like foundational or baseline and then levels in terms of intimacy, when you were talking, Ed, the one thing I thought of is I think personal opinions and beliefs is difficult for a lot of individuals, at least in American society, because they don't know how to communicate them. So they may have them, but the ability to share that with another person or tell them what they are, I think, is is cha- very challenging. Well, let's let's use like social media as an example, right? You have a lot of people shouting their personal opinions and beliefs of people that they have no idea who they are. These are not safe communication spaces um, and you're getting your feelings hurt because other people aren't respecting your feelings and your beliefs. It's not supposed, it's not, that is not an intimate uh, location. So I think we need to, I always need to remember (laughs) that I need to stay out of the comment section because I'm going to get my feelings hurt. <laughs> like most YouTube videos. Exactly. Popular YouTube videos, I should say. Well, I feel that people take the internet, so to speak, you know, which in within which lies social media. I think they feel like it's the the free range of like, a personal opinion like that they can say whatever they want without consequence or yeah. with limited impact um of the consequence upon themselves for that and that's where i think there is a bit of a disconnect that people are not aware of the impact of what it is that they say or how others 
may feel um, with that specifically. Yeah, and it's really upsetting because it's like a, uh, a positive feedback loop. Uh, the more that you engage in it, the louder it gets, the worse that it gets. The more that you piss somebody off, the more that you get pissed off. Um, it just, it, it's, uh, it's not great. <laughs> And, and I think that makes sense. And the, and the, I think what's missing mostly is the discord, like, um, not discord, the mediation, like someone to help individuals understand each other, um, like to be the interpreter, the translator, like the counselor, the middle ground communicator, like, you know what I mean? Like, like, so that both individuals both sides whatever it may be kind of a better understanding of the other's perspective i kind of wonder what it would be like if articles on social media just turned off the comment section if there was no option to to put your comments i believe that um, was previously referred to as a blog with the comments turned off I'm trying to remember which website did that. That was a big deal. That was probably like what, six, seven, eight years ago. There was, a, I remember there was a popular blog site or something. And I don't think it was CNET. Somebody like just made that effective decision and like put the hammer down. It was like, we are turning off comments for all postings. End of story. And it was a big to do because no one had ever done that before. And they got criticized because they were like, you're, you're hampering free speech and blah, blah, blah. And they were like, no. Like we're reporting something because it was for a journalistic site, if I remember correctly. And it was like, a, that's the end of it. Like we stand on the credibility of what it is that we post. We're not allowing you to turn this into a war zone, like in the comment section, so to speak, which I find interesting. It's like in YouTube now you can dislike a video, but they took the statistics away. So the public doesn't see that. So they're what they've done is they've, reduce the potential for a ganging up effect on what that is. Plus, I don't know how it's affected the logarithm theoretically. It still might be a piece of the calculations on whether or not you get to know about a video. Um, because in theory, dislikes would derank the popularity of something. So therefore it wouldn't be promoted or it wouldn't come up like in like a suggestion for you. But I find that interesting that now when you go to a video, like you don't, see that piece of it hmm. i can see i can see it having both positive and negative um impacts uh but i think for like what we're talking about um i feel like people are that there is a disconnect um between levels of intimacy regarding social media um, and that it definitely has a, um, I, I, I think that it's problematic. Right. And Cody said in the live chat, a lot of people just feel entitled to their opinions and feel threatened when they get a little pushback, which I don't disagree with. I think we've lost the capacity as an American society or maybe a global society to have discourse. And by that, I mean to have like a conversation, a healthy form of communication where people can come to a reason point of which we may not agree, but we will agree to disagree. Like, I think some people say that now, but they really don't understand what that means. Like, I think that's a, a de facto statement. And it's like, mm -hmm. no, have you really, really made an effort and tried or attempted to understand the other individual? It's natural for people to disagree with you. Like, we're not a hive mind. That's not how this works. So people will individually have certain aspects of things. You know, some people love bubblegum. Other people love cotton candy. Not everyone likes both. So ergo, there will be people that have, a, you know, a difference of opinion about those things. But um, I think what, what happens is, is people tend to internalize um someone not supporting them or agreeing with them and they become defensive 
And mm -hmm. I think it goes along the lines with uh, the fact that a lot of people are posting things to to social media, um, it, it, but they're really putting out something that is more of an intimate nature that you really don't want to share with some people that you don't want to have that in intimacy with. And then when people who do see that, that you didn't intend to to have that same sort of level of intimacy, that that's where people get hurt. Right, because, you know, we're talking about, you know, if I put out my thoughts and feelings, um, I'm opening the door to other people's thoughts and feelings. Um, and if I'm putting out my um needs emotions and desires my highest level of intimate uh, needs i'm opening the door to have anybody um respond to that um and i think maybe you know people need to be aware of that and cognizant of that uh and that you know that that can be that's not you don't always get what you want when and, you do that and don't get me wrong there's plenty of platforms that have certain controls in regards to that so you can still post on a social media platform but only to those people that you choose to let into that level of intimacy you could say so people can have set up a different oh, list for yeah their, the list of different things so um i don't want my parents to see this whole thing about me thinking this guy is hot or something and like I, that. And, and I think in terms of, uh, uh, this is my limited knowledge because I'm not like up on the most recent newer like social media platforms, but in terms of Facebook, I think that's the one place where we don't really see that much of it anymore. I remember like a number of years ago, maybe five, within five to 10 years, there was a huge amount of like people just posting things and the whole world, like being able to see it and comment it on like, and it would cause all this like consternation or, you know, debate discussion and all this stuff. And I, and I think people have learned over time to not like how to set privacy, how to create their digital boundaries within that platform. So they're not um, finding themselves being, you know, under scrutiny of, you know, billions of people, quote unquote. Um, and Twitter doesn't quite have that. Tw Twitter does to a certain point, but not to not to the same intricacy. It's either public to the whole world or specific, like you lock it down and it's only the people that you allow to see it because you allow them to be your friend, quote unquote. Yeah, instead of having yeah. lists, you have different accounts. <laughs> yes. Well, um, right. That, I was just going to say that earlier. Thanks for bringing that up, Jeff. Like, or you, or you uh, delineate it on your own by being like, okay, so this is my work profile. This is my, this is my dirty, naughty profile. This is my friends and family profile. <laughs> like you, like you create these things to, to, you know, divide them off. Well, and like, you know, um, what, what happens often or, and what I run into and what I think, you know, I remember from the group chat is you gotta be careful that <laughs> where you're opening some of these uh some of these apps right because you know ugh, oof. sometimes i open my twitter and penis everywhere and i'm not in a penis everywhere place funny that the, that the whole funny. the whole the whole world is not a penis everywhere place i mean technically oh. physically all over the world in most places, except for probably Antarctica, there are penises everywhere. So, like, to me, that's the bigger irony. Like, we are surrounded by them, literally. And yet, uh, the society of the globe is more, like, you know. I think we're more referring to visible, pe uh, visible penis everywhere. BP. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Probably in a state of arousal. <laughs> Speaking of arousal... Oh my goodness, yeah. So speaking um, of penis. It's penis. Um, no, we, we did not talk about the example, by the way, which is a great example. Oh, the example? Oh, the, yeah, farting, the farting stage, stage of a relationship. Um, like that's how you know when you're in a intimate more uh, a, uh, a more intimate stage of your relationship 
when you're when you can fart around each other. Like, I thought about that earlier and I like, I giggled. I think about how I don't know if it's still the case now. I've known couples, I've known people in relationships that they won't be in the same space for like bodily functions. So, like, I I don't want to get too graphic into descriptions, but it's like if someone has to use the bathroom, we'll say. Even Uh though in a relationship and they live together, I have known couples that both of them cannot be in that space together. It is just an absolute, like, boundary, no-go zone. Yeah, Um, I, I, I am in that relationship. And yet there are others who are like... Maybe it's a body. I got a body. You got a body. It kind of does the same things. Like, don't really care. Um, those those people who are in a relationship uh, uh, where uh, they're uh, uh, going at it, and then the bottom farts while they're in the middle of it because gas. Right. Like we may not be. We not may not be the right. <laughs> <laughs> group for this kind of a discussion <laughs> my thought is like baby if you're gonna put air in air has to get out like that's that's just a physics kind of thing that's how that works so that comes yeah. with the territory i, I will you, say a very like good a relationship be when that happens they both break down and start laughing hysterically yeah well that's actually a really good segue to arousal <laughs> <laughs> that's bogus Yes. For some people, for some people, that can be a total boner killer, um, or a boner maker. Oh, Ooh, yeah, true. Um, that is true. You don't know their kids. Okay, you know, don't, don't kink shame me. Um, all right. So basically, arousal is the physical response to some kind of stimuli, like we kind of talked about. Like you can get. You can get arousal from music. You can get arousal from, uh, you know, a, a wide range of things. But we're kind of, you know, I think we're kind of talking about sexual arousal in this kind of framework. Um, so, but there is a, a problem um, with individuals when it comes to arousal uh, because sometimes they have, they want to avoid instances especially in relationships where they might be um where they might get aroused um because there is some kind of uh you know problem with the ways that you experience arousal like there may be some shame or some guilt um so we may you know and we may not be feeling sexy right because there's there is a um uh, there's a difference between desire and arousal, right? So desire is our level of wanting, our, our level of like wanting sexual action, um, interaction, and arousal is just the, the response um, to that experience, right? Um, but in times where our, you know, level, right, our desire level is kind of low right we may not be we may want to avoid situations where that could happen um and gary and i or gary sent a ted talk to me um on arousal um for couples which i thought was really good and it talked about this concept called the arousal runway um meaning that like you know in order to get lift off you might need to um start slow right so you know this uh ted talk was talking about the concept of you know when you when when you're in a couple and there may be some difficulties uh surrounding arousal um or approaching arousal um you may want to start having conversations with your partner um or engaging with um, uh, like erotica, um, possibly watching some porn together um, in order to start that process, right? So it's something that is like outside of you, right? It's not something between you. Um, 
so that can help start get the psychological arousal starting right um and then you can start moving to face to face which is when you are both uh possibly like role playing a sexy scene or you know doing something that might you know turn the both of you on um but my uh tip um to couples is start small like if you are feeling like hey you know what like i'm not feeling wildly sexy right what are you feeling what do you have desire enough to do can you hold hands are you okay with that are you okay for like a makeout session right and then see what happens right um so like i cuz i think that sometimes people get into this mindset that there's an expectation of like it's going to be all or nothing right we're we're going to go to town um and you know sometimes you know i'm not feeling that so then my ideas of doing that go into the toilet it's it's interesting Ed, that you're talking about like the concept in this this idea of the arousal runway about side by side by using something that's removed from you and, and the partner or partners and about porn and i was thinking about what you were just saying about how like you may not be feeling you know the desire to really you know get into the the, the nitty gritty or whatever and what occurred to me is, is like that's where pornography adult entertainment whatever you want to call it most often doesn't portray that or explain yeah. it like it just kind of skips past a bunch of things and gets like immediately to the action or if it does contain any percentage of that it gets skipped probably more by men i'm gonna take a wild guess than by women because we are more visually stimulated and we just kind of want to see the sex action <laughs> like like i don't know how, i don't know how else to say it like i think about like you know you just kind of want to get to the good stuff um which is possibly a psychological um issue because we're skipping over recognizing that there you know there are these other things yeah um you bring up a really good point and i do think that there is so there are porn sites out there that i think would would really cater to this um a lot of ethical porn um would you know there's uh actually a company i don't know if it's a company or a platform called Himeros. have you ever heard of that not a fan it's h-i-m-e-r-o-s dot tv um and it's kind of uh it's 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 porn um it's sexually sexually explicit media um but it's in a way educational um and it is not just all about penetration um, and the sexual act. Sometimes they have videos on, you know, Tantra or, um, you know, uh, oral or, you know, uh, and sometimes they don't even involve uh, orgasm. Um, so I feel like watching something more along that um, would be, you know, I think that, that would be more on the the arousal runway. It's interesting. So I went to the website, uh, hemorose.tv, and it's interesting because they're as they market it, it says you've never seen porn like this. Um, and it says hemorose.tv is about authenticity. It's about real connections between real men. It's about sexual ecstasy and pleasure. It's about exploration and discovery, which is a different take than like what you know I was describing a moment ago about how I think most um adult entertainment pornography is about the act itself um you know and the the orgasm and that's just kind of it uh yeah 
So that's interesting. I didn't, yeah, I didn't know that this site existed. Um, not safe for work. Anybody who's listening to this by chance, um, don't do this on a work at device all. or at work. <laughs> yeah, no. It's, um, um, I mean, it's an adult site. I, I want to say it's explicit, but I'm like, well, it is technically porn. And then there's also a series of videos called Backstage. This is interesting. Um, I guess I haven't seen any of it, but they like have discussions about some of the films that they've made, which I find it very interesting. Um, so one of the suggestions in the TED talk that you uh, that you sent me was um, actually to have a couple um, send, you know, so like maybe one member of the couple is suggesting two por- pornographic videos for the other that they think that the other partner would find enticing, right? So it can be an exercise in let me let me think about what I think would turn you on. Um, and I think that that can also help foster um, and build connections to intimacy um, because you are trying to um, understand the sexual intimacy of your partner Mm -hmm. from an external standpoint. And you know. right, I, and I think the the other thing is is that that what you're sharing with them is unreal. I don't know how I want to phrase that. It's distant. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's the best way to say it. Like, like I'm thinking about how it's imaginary, Un- unless. Well, for- Unless for some reason you can share something that is not, but that's so few and far between in my experience. Well, it's not so, it's not likely that I'm gonna send them content of another real couple, I guess, is what I, where I'm going with that. Yeah, no. Um I think that also kind of talks about like uh like fantasy. Like, you know, here is an example of a uh, fantasy, right, that I might have um, mm-hmm. that is not in my head, right, and here is a visual representation of that, right, and that is an intimate um, act, right, because I'm sharing with you a fantasy that I have a personal fantasy um, mm-hmm. and you know, the what we know about fantasies are that they are our friends, right, and they are guide posts right to let us know what turns us on um and that our fantasies don't have to necessarily translate into behaviors um so like you know there are a lot of people that i know that have fantasies that they have no desire to act out with in person um but sometimes it can be really hot to share fantasies with another person Right. I mean, I think that's one of the things that adult entertainment does for us in general is it gives us the ability to imagine or to fantasize about ourselves having said experience that we're viewing or like yep. witnessing, but it's remote. Um, but but that's also a very mature and kind of cerebral perspective. Um, I'll be honest, my like. 13 to 20 something self did not comprehend or necessarily see that um, to that level, I guess. Uh, So, yeah, like, yeah, (laughs) it's just funny. Sorry, I'm just like thinking back. I'm like, nope. Was it was it was it happening was not it was not in my brain capacity. (laughs) Um. Yeah, and so uh, something else to consider is that the person that you're with and even ourselves, um, we're only going to have sex within the limits of our sexual development, Um, meaning that – so David Snart said that we stick to having sex in familiar ways that keep us comfortable. Having sex beyond our sexual development creates anxiety and makes us nervous. Mastering this anxiety is how you become a sexually mature uh, adult, so like – 
in a relationship, right, when we're starting a relationship, we are usually crossing out um, possibly like sexual uh, behaviors that uh, you and I are not okay with, right? Um, Like we're not okay with this. We're not okay with that, right? And these are the things that we are okay with. Um, But if I ask you, hey, I would be interested in this, my anxiety um, goes to the roof because that's not that's not part of my sexual development yet. Um, I think that's really profound because as as you were going over that quote, I was thinking like, wow, like I, I think that's the crux of your existence, like in terms of arousal and being intimate with another person physically, sexually. Um, if you uh have anxiety and and the anxiety becomes like your limitation and you don't move through and then beyond then you will always be within that space whatever it may be Exper- experiential avoidance right i avoid situations that cause me anxiety mm-hmm. i totally get that it it makes sense to me i have I'm not going to get into the details of it, but I will share that in my past, I had a very specific mindset about something and to this day still have, I still have anxious feelings regarding this particular um, circumstance, but I also realized that it made me incredibly biased um, and dismissive of other people and like, it, it 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 was exhibited in my personality in in a negative way, basically, because of my personal experience and this like anxiety that came out of it. I ended up treating all circumstances akin or similar or parallel or whatever. Like I I treated it all the same, which was not fair, because I was taking mm-hmm. a handful of experiences and multiplying that as an always. Like this will always be the treatment or this will always be the outcome. This will always be, you know, this. Um, And that's not fair. But I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't taken the time to really think about it and and sort of get challenged on it. And I also think that um, that really speaks to what like what you're talking about. Right. That's our own personal experience. Right. But then we project that onto other people. Um, like, Hey, that's not okay. Right. So, you know, I, um, you know, I may have a fear of BDSM, right? Like, uh, that may be something that I'm like, Oh, I don't like that. Right. Um, but then I say, well, because I don't like it, nobody does. And because, because I have an anxiety about that, that means that it's wrong. Um, when that's not true. Um, but there is always usually this desire, this like arousal, um, component with these things that is enticing. Um, and that's where I think a lot of discrepancy comes in where like people are aroused by certain stuff that they, that could be within their ethical makeup, right? But they are just too anxious to do it because they're afraid. Right. No, I, I would agree with that. And there's something else that um, came to mind at the beginning of us discussing about Rosal that I wanted to draw attention to. That's um, it can be complicated. It doesn't have to be. Um, arousal as a physical aspect can occur without um, desire. Yeah. Or consent. Like this is one of the the biggest things that is problematic, I think, in terms of. Um, I guess it's not really harassment. It's more along the lines of, um, I guess, the only thing that comes to mind is rape. Like in cases of someone being aroused, quote unquote, there's been a. a in my opinion, I agree with this concept that it's misconstrued. Just because someone is physically aroused does not mean that they actually want to do whatever that may be, like, in that moment. Yep, and that's why it's really, 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 really important to distinguish between sexual desire and sexual 
arousal. Um, that you cannot want something, um, but your body is going to respond because that's what it's designed to do. Right. So someone gets stimulated, someone gets excited, but it doesn't mean that they're actually enjoying it. Yeah. Yep. And the, and the reverse can happen. Someone can actually really be enjoying something, but not showing it physically. Like there may be some type of capacity that is not occurring at that moment or be possible. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't it doesn't mean that they don't enjoy it. Like, I, and I think that's one of the things that we, especially in America, have really misconstrued because we think like if we have a partner, let's say, and we're, you know, having sexual intimacy, but they're not really responding, they're not giving any physical like, you know, sensations or, you know, you're not really getting anything from them. You may think that they're not enjoying it, but that's the only way you're going to know is to communicate, to actually ask. And determine because maybe, you know, they are, you know, perfectly fine, but, you know, or they're really enjoying it, but they don't really emote or show that necessarily. And we could go into a whole other thing on sexual desire and, um, you know, and the there is this whole problematic um, focus on female desire. Um, but a lot of it has to do with the fact that they, a lot of women aren't satisfied. Um, and if, if sex is, uh, a reward, right. If, you know, um, I, if, if sex isn't pleasurable, I don't want to do it. I have no desire to do it. Um, so, you know, that, that's the problem. (laughs) You know, it's, it's not necessarily that women don't want to have sex. It's why isn't it pleasurable for them? Right. And I mean, and I think that also happens with men. Like, I I think that's a a key factor that some people are not aware of is that, you know, just because a person. I don't know how else to say it. It's really messy for us as um, as one label or classification, men who have sex with men um, to look at it that way, because if you think about it from that context, there's a presumption because you enter into like sexual arousal intimacy with another person that you enjoy it, which is, which is fair, but it's far too broad. Like we've had this discussion before about like your position slash role and what that is. And I saw something recently and it really bothered me because it was kind of a survey or a reference to something. It was like, it was going to be a podcast, I think. Anyways, the, the, like they, there was a preface and they were going to discuss like what these what these titles of these positions mean and notably missing from the list was side. So like top bottom verse was totally there, but like that was it. And I was like, that's disappointing. You don't. Well, th- Right. But oh, what yeah. I mean is, is like, but you don't even have to know what the term side is. My, my, the disappointment for me was like, it's all focusing on anal. Like, it's like they've completely forgotten that it's like possible to be like sexually active with another person and not have anal as your defining capacity. That's, that was one of the, um, in my limit in my limitations and strengths section, um, I had to add a section on the bias of my study on the, uh, basically that like there, um, that anal intercourse is a requirement of, of sex, right? And which it's not, and that like if people decide not to have anal intercourse, that like there's a problem which of course is not. Um. Right. And, and I think that that's something that um, I guess men in general are coming to terms with, at least in terms of like gay men, um, I guess is really what I'm thinking about because I think for quite a long time, we have this concept of like virility and what comes with that and what is defined by that and how we portray that. Um, 
And in some ways it was kind of a hyper masculine thing, but really what it comes down to is, is like, there was this presumption that like, that if two men were going to have sex, there someone was inserting another person. And that was just the end of it. Um, and what I find interesting is, is I think that's been slowly changing over time, especially with men, I think as they age, that they still are intimate, they're still aroused, but they don't necessarily want to engage in, in anal play, um, which I find interesting. I think had the surgeons of ED meds um, in the medical like realm, had that not come on the scene the way it did and really kind of taken off and permeated like our culture, I think there would have been more in that area of recognition that like there's there's a whole lot of options. It doesn't have to be about putting something in someone's butt. Do you know what I mean? I sure do. (laughs) (laughs) Um exactly. Um So to like wrap all that up, um, intimacy is important, um, especially when we're talking about arousal in relationships. Um, So, you know, something to consider. Um, Also, shame and guilt can negatively impact intimacy and arousal. Um, So the way that that somebody uh, is kind of internalizing the things that turn them on um that may impact their level of intimacy in a relationship um also take baby steps right um if you're finding that um you want to be connected to your partner um but you're afraid start small um and communicate and then also like oh gary we're gonna say something well, what I think is important, like in terms of taking baby steps, is to uh, I don't know how I want to say this. Travel at the at your pace of comfort. I guess is the best way I can phrase that. And so, development. Like, right, right. So, like, I, I don't want people to think like that they always have to take baby steps. Like that's one possibility, but you might take initial small steps. And then once there's been comfort established, trust, um, you have a stronger bond, you may be willing to go further at a different pace um, Mm -hmm. and take more, uh, you know, I guess, bigger steps, I guess, however you want to look at that. Yeah. <laughs> what I, I mean, I, I see what you're getting at, Jeff, with the analogy, because then, like, you know, that the depth determines the speed. And mm-hmm. whether or not the individuals are being recogni- recognizing that for compatibility. The depth. Would you say? Say that again. <laughs> right. Right, right. Like, I think of this um, as an example. I tend to be attracted to guys that are taller than me. If Uh I find myself established in a relationship with someone who is probably around six foot, which would be an ideal thing for me, um, we have to work through walking together, like, because their stride, their gait, their pace is going to be different than mine. So either... Oh, little legs. <laughs> kind of. You know, and it's like, so, um, you know, you have to you have to kind of negotiate that, which is totally relevant to everything we were discussing today. Like, you find that together um, and, you know, and then proceed uh, accordingly. All, all, all relationships mature at a different rate. Right. 
And apparently, when I came back from uh, stepping away, I forgot to unmute my mic and OBS. So only you guys heard most of what I said before. Okay. But, it's uh, okay. Yeah. Anyway, it's the um, analogy of of a relationship growing as a uh, human. Right. Uh, and then also explore your fantasies. Um, they might be the doorway to some great experiences. This is true. That totally makes me think of a title of a porn. Was it in the 70s? See, now I'm going to have to go look it up. Hang on. And no one may even know what this thing is um, if they're not familiar with it. It's yep. Porn IMDb, right? Behind the Green Door uh, is from December of 1972. Uh, it's an American feature length pornographic film considered one of the genre's classic pictures from what was called the Golden Age of Porn, which was 1969 to 1984, and it features Marilyn Chambers. Now, why do I know about this? Because my father was uh, a collector of adult entertainment. <laughs> so, oh, like, it's a random factoid, but I remember hearing about this, like, within the the underground culture of, like, adult film, that there was this movie called Behind the Green Door and that it was a big deal. Anyways, that's what I thought of just now. Sorry, Ed, to derail what you. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> that's funny. Um... So. But yeah, so no, I agree. Like, you know, you never know what, what is on the other side. Yeah. Um, so that that's it. Nice. Wow. Somebody else said it. I, I think I think there are there are more things than what we covered today regarding intimacy and arousal. Um, maybe we'll revisit it at another time. I like the idea of doing sexual desire. Um, as a topic at some point in the future, maybe. And, oh yeah. And um, so. <laughs> Agreed. I think that would be a good topic too. Yay. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. All right. So, if you happen to have ideas, thoughts, opinions. You can comment. We don't restrict that. You can you can share them with us. Yeah, you can do that in plenty of places, such as like cubsnotallowed.com, our website. You can leave a comment on the blog there. You can also uh, shoot us an email, cubsnotallowed at gmail.com. Uh, you could actually talk to us verbally by leaving us voicemail at 361-COL-TALK, 361-265-8255. Uh, you can comment on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Cubs Out Loud. Uh, same at Twitter and YouTube. That Cubs Out Loud in the appropriate place of the URL. Uh, you can chat us up directly, all three of us. And then Damon, who's not here right now, is also in that chat, as well as many other people at, at tinyworld.com slash telegram dash col. You can find out when we're planning on recording these shows, such as the next Landscape of Relationship show. By subscribing to our Google Calendar at tinyworld.com slash calendar dash col. You can get many of the accoutrements, such as a Cubs Out Loud shirt, a hat, or various other things over on Zazzle at zazzle.com slash Cubs Out Loud. Uh, some of the designs we have there are designed by Smashy, which you can get more of his work at tpublic.com slash user slash Smashy the Bear. Uh, you can also become a patron at patreon.com slash Cubs Out Loud or... Uh, if you just want to send us a donation, you can do that at paypal.me slash Cubs Out Loud. You can subscribe to us and uh, rate us and review us on many uh, podcast directory, such as Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Amazon Audible, and Spotify. You can find me anywhere on the internet as Box Step, Box Puppy, Box Cub, Box something or other, or Windgem, W Y N D G E M, on Twitch, uh, where I host Bears and Dragons where a bunch of us nerdy-ass bears sit around and play Dungeons & Dragons. Gary? Nice. If you want to get in touch with me, you can pretty much find me anywhere online as GearBear73. Um, for the adult uh, interest stuff that I have on Twitter, specifically, it's GearBear73XXX. And um, no matter what the platform is, uh, just shoot me a message 
if you like friend request me or something so that way like i have an idea as to who you are because otherwise i just think you're a bot and i'm not going to pay attention just you know mr uh sorry dr Doctor. edward <laughs> if people uh, want to get in touch with you how would they do that sure so you are free to friend me on facebook uh as uh at, on on there is edward ac um you can look at my uh, business website at eactherapy.com. Um, I have a TikTok. Um, it is now updated to dr.unicub79. And my Insta uh, Instagram is also dr.instacub. No, I'm sorry. dr.unicub underscore sex brain wizard. And if you want to uh, interact with me on Twitter, you can find me as Eddie H. Cook. Or for that NSFW stuff, uh, Jeep Daddy 3. Um, but like Gary said, just shoot me a message to let me know who you are. Because um, I don't need any awkwardness. <laughs> Understood. Maybe that. Say goodnight, everybody. Good night. Ciao for now.